this Whitaker Chambers piece, right? Witness. It's about his personal testimony coming from being a communist to being really one of the most eloquent anti-communist <clears throat> writers in America and really embracing Christianity. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, what, what's the deal with it, right? Well, I think one key to understanding the text is when he talks about suffering. Suffering is kind of a thing for him. He says towards the beginning that tragedy occurs not with death, but with suffering. When one embraces suffering and pain in an attempt to fight against evil, right? The exact quote, he says, is that crime, violence, and infamy are not tragedy. Tragedy occurs when a human soul awakes and seeks in suffering and pain to free itself from crime, violence, infamy, even at the cost of life. The struggle is the tragedy, not defeat or death. And so this is why he says the spectacle of tragedy has always filled men not with despair, but with hope and exultation. Okay. So, you know, the tragedy is the, the, um, the unfolding of this struggle of the soul against evil. And in order to to, to challenge what is evil, one must uh, not try to escape suffering and pain, but must go through suffering and pain. And in doing so, can then find <clears throat> that liberation from, from suffering and from tragedy and from evil, okay? <clears throat> but it's a path through, I think, is, is kind of one of the things that he's saying here. Through the suffering and the pain comes the liberation and the freedom, okay? Um, <clears throat> Why am I highlighting that in particular, right? Well, one of his main points about communism is not is that communism is not really about an economic system. It's not really about a um, <clears throat> um, a vision for how social groups ought to interact. He says really what's at the heart of it is a belief, a faith in materialism, okay? But more than that, in man and human beings in their ability of their mind to create a new world and a better world okay and there's in this this kind of idea uh central to it is like the human mind is going to create and solve the problems the human mind is going to bring about liberation the human mind is going to bring about utopia not you know moving through suffering and pain towards the resurrection, like in the Christian vision, right? So it's, it's, it's a materialist philosophy, and it is based in a faith in man and in the ability of the reason by itself in the mind to, to reshape the world. But he likens it really to the sin of Adam, right? The sin of renunciation. Okay, so rather than this leading to creation, it really just leads to renunciation, okay, of what God has created. All right. And one has to kind of shut oneself off from creation, including from other human beings, so that one becomes somewhat immune to, say, the sufferings of other human beings or the lives of other human beings, because they really become something expendable in this alternative faith uh, that's being lived out. All right. Now, also connected to this is, is something we've talked about before in this class, which we call voluntarism, right? Which is that that which is real is, you know, it's not, it's not real in the sense that it's connected to a metaphysical reality. It's real in the sense that it's named by the human mind, within the human mind. This is kind of similar to Nietzsche and the will to power, right? In any of these cases, right, the central point is that the faith is not in God and in <clears throat> respecting the natural order created by God, and in trying to fulfill and find happiness through <clears throat> through our nature, through being through living in consistency with our nature created by God, made in His image, but rather something that we're going to figure out for ourselves or create for us, try to create for ourselves. But He says this leads really just to renunciation and to destruction. Okay. Um, <clears throat> However, right, what can awaken someone from this faith or convert one from this faith is witnessing in another person the, tr the tragedy of suffering. Witnessing in another person a, a human soul trying to struggle against evil. So he talks about the screams, like there was this, the, he was talking to this girl and her father had been a communist and then he stopped being a, a communist. 
uh, because he heard the screams, okay? And he says, everyone's heard the screams. Everyone knew about the screams. But it was something about, there's a certain point where you hear the screams, and it's the screams, you realize it's the screams not just of a person in physical pain. It's the screams of a human soul, someone writhing in anguish, right? And that there's something about hearing this that awakens a logic in the soul, is what Whitaker says. So rather than the logic of the mind prevailing, suddenly this logic of the soul just awakens and makes you alert to the reality that you can't deny, okay? You can't, it's so obvious you can't deny it. That soul is in pain. What's happening to them is evil. This is wrong, right? So in, in a similar way with looking through the Holocaust, right? People who would deny there's an objective moral right and wrong facing the evil of the Holocaust, facing the, the suffering souls trying to resist the evil of the Holocaust. There's no denying that's evil, right? It, we can all recognize it. We can all see it, okay? And then that awakens in us an awareness that there is this universal, perhaps, universal human nature that we share with that other suffering soul, first of all, that allows us to be attuned to it and to hear it and to recognize it, to commune with that other person in a sense. But also then, that we're, we, where did we get this universal nature? Nature from God made in his image. So this awareness, this attunedness of hearing the human soul in suffering can awaken us to the spiritual reality, can awaken us to um, the reality of God and our relationship to him as his children, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's very important. The, 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 then he kind of goes into this discussion of the real crisis in Western civilization. The real crisis in Western civilization is not economic, it is not political. He says it's total, it involves those things, but ultimately it's spiritual. It's a crisis of faith, he says. So do you believe in man or do you believe in God? Do you believe simply in the human mind's ability to save itself or do you believe that God's grace saves you? So, it's, so th that's the fundamental crisis, he said. And it's not a Western crisis particularly. It's a world crisis, right? And um, he says the extent to which we move away from God into the other camp of renouncing God and his creation, then we're losing. And the extent to which we move towards God, then it's going to be okay, right? So, <clears throat> so if we thought about, think about the earlier discussion about consumerism this week, well, consumerism could be in the other camp, it could be moving away from, from God and focusing too much on the human human um, <clears throat> ingenuity, saving itself through science or something like that. That would, that would also be detrimental, part of the crisis, in other words. So this is bigger than just the, the specific social structures of communism or capitalism, right? It's, it's, it's uh, bigger than ideology. It's a crisis of faith, a spiritual crisis, he's saying. All right, now, <clears throat> what... <clears throat> So, so this kind of this crisis has kind of alienated us from our own nature to a, to a some extent, I think he would say, right? It's alienated us from our nature, okay? And so one way to be to to be more in touch with that, right, is to be out in in nature and to experience it and to actually allow ourselves to, to experience the wonder of nature, the beauty of nature. A sunset, right, over the Grand Canyon. The way the light moves through leaves. The way the wind moves through the leaves in a tree, right? <clears throat> the fact that it, like, if you look at a bird and like it's alive, like, and it's mo and it's got its own kind of like internal. Uh, <clears throat> It's animate. It's got life. Like, where did that come from? And why aren't we, like, uh, amazed by it, right? <clears throat> and all the tremendous variety and uh, drama of nature all around us, right? So he's going on and on about the life on the farm with his children. And he really, the, one of the centerpieces of this text is his own kind of moment where he says where he first really moved away from communism in his heart which was looking at his daughter's ear and noticing just the intricacies of it and realizing that there's no way this beautiful child and this just focusing on the intricacy of her ear, right? There's no way that she is a random compilation of matter. No, she is an amazing image of God, right? A daughter of God and like... She couldn't have just happened to come into existence. Like God made her. There was, a, there was an intelligence and an act of love behind it, right? And so 
really attuning ourselves to nature or to other people, to the natural world, is also a way in which we awaken the soul to the spiritual reality and awaken ourselves to our true nature as being made in God's image. So that's why his, he goes on and on about kind of the, the, the importance of being attuned to nature. And he says it had trained the children to be sensitive, to recognize beauty, to recognize complexity and richness, so that even at a young age, he said, because they had grown up so close to nature, they could recognize the beauty of a very complex piece of music. They could recognize the beauty and the truth in a very complex um, piece of writing, okay? It, the soul becomes sensitive and attuned to the complexities of human nature, and thus the truth that speaks in, uh, the truth that can come to us through really, really good art, right? Right? <clears throat> and, um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> So, so that sense of wonder is important, and to experience, and to go out into nature, and to marvel at it, and to appreciate it, and to be thankful to God for it, right? All of that's connected to it. Okay, and then, but then he ends by saying, you know, he, and it's all very tender, like he's, he has the children by the hand, and he's leading them, and he says, really where we're going is, we're going to Golgotha, the place of the skull, where the cross is, the crucifixion. And he kind of ends it there, and he says, look, you have to realize, and maybe you won't, you know, you won't realize this till after I'm gone, okay? <clears throat> but every human life is going to involve pain and is going to involve suffering, and we, there's no escape from that, okay? There's no way to sort of like um, <clears throat> not live as a full life and also at the same time suffer. And he says that when you know that and you understand that, right? <clears throat> then you'll be wise, right? Because we're always struggling, he says, each of us hangs always upon the cross of himself. We're struggling against our own evil tendencies, I think is kind of what he's saying there, right? And perhaps, and this is kind of maybe where I would, you know, look, tragedy is not the end. Suffering and the struggle against evil is not the end. There's also through that freedom and liberation from evil and <clears throat> the resurrection and love, okay? Okay, so tragedy is not the end, right? There's, there's something beyond it um, <clears throat> that he's pointing us to there. But I think um, it's, it's, it's fascinating, though, that he has, he kind of begins and also ends there with, with that image of suffering. Um, <clears throat> and part of the importance of that is what it, it recalls us to our own humanity, right? And it recalls us to the reality of who we are made in God's image and to what true freedom means in being in tune with our nature as God made us, and in tune with our uh, relationship to God as his children. All right, look, how are you? I hope you're well. All right, and please do have a happy Easter, all right?